I did want to say a few words before we kind of just open it up for a wide ranging discussion or Q and A, however you want to uh, view it. Uh, just to try to put it into uh, some sort of historical context. Uh, those of you who uh, are familiar with uh, that aspect of international working class history, uh, um, you know, the, the, the Russian Revolution, the, the, the period leading up to the first revolution that took place in, in 1905 to 1907, then the February Revolution of 1917, and then, of course, the October Socialist Revolution of 1917. Um, uh, we'll know that um, the, the party, uh, which later on became the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, and it was called the Bolsheviks and, and so on, but the formal name of that party was the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party pretty long handle, but that's what it was called. And in those days, uh, um, you might wonder why was it called social democratic? You know, I mean, the social democrats are, are the NDPers, they're the uh, uh, reformists and so on and so forth today. But at that juncture, in terms of the uh, revolutionary movement, particularly in Europe, um, 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 the social democrats were all in one movement. They had different parties in different countries, but uh, it was quite uh, typical for um, Marxist parties or were parties who were following the tradition of the first communist international and the second international and so on uh, to, to call themselves social democratic. Uh, and that was to uh, um, essentially to make the argument that it's not just a question of, uh, of um, uh, the economic demands, but the social needs of the working class uh, that needed to be addressed as a class. Uh, and so um, that's why it was called the Russian, uh, Russian Social Democratic Labour Party. When the split took place in the international movement around the time of the First World War, um, which I think we, we talked about in the club previously, that's uh, when uh, I guess the, the rubber hit the road between uh, a revolutionary line and an opportunistic reformist line. Um, um, it came to a head at the time of the First World War when a number of parties, including the, the German Social Democratic Party, um, the Labour Party in Britain and, and, and in, in France, um, uh, voted because they were mass parties. They had members in, in the uh, Reichstag and the, you know, in the, in the French parliament and so on and so forth. Um, these parties, a number of these parties voted in favor of uh, war credits for their respective countries uh, to go to war. Um, so the war, they didn't start the war, but they had a choice when it, when the, when the issue came up of how to finance it. In other words, the parliaments had to approve um, borrowing in order to buy tanks and guns and so on and so forth in order to prosecute uh, this war, which after all was an imperialist war, it was an inter-imperialist war. It was uh, to uh, re-carve up um, Africa to seize colonies, German colonies, French colonies, uh, British colonies, and so on. Uh, to carve up and recarve up the Middle East, um, the colonial uh, territories that had been seized by the colonial powers in Asia, and so on, and it was a scramble. It was a it was a conflict between these various imperialist powers, and that's what made the, the whole character of the war an imperialist war. And for working class parties, but supposedly revolutionary parties, Marxist parties to go into their respective parliaments and vote in favor of financing this war was an abject betrayal of principle. Um, um, but they did it and they did it for very opportunistic reasons. And the logic went, well, um, we, don't, we oppose the war, of course, we don't like the war, but if our side wins, that's to say, if Germany wins, or if France wins, or if England wins, then that will, some of the benefits 
of this division of the world will will uh, accrue to workers in this country. We'll get higher wages and so on. So they place the narrow interests of their own uh, respective uh, labor movements before um, um, their internationalist responsibilities. You know, so you had a situation of, you know, in the in the butchery that was the First World War in the trenches and the, the poison gas and, and the slaughter, millions upon millions um, were, were killed during that war. Um, they were mostly workers, French workers, German workers, uh, English workers. Uh, um, Canada was part of that war as well. And so was, so was the United States later on. Um, um, so you had workers killing workers for the benefit of competing sections of monopoly, co competing sections of the capitalist class and, uh, in these different countries. So it, it, that brought the, 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 the differences in the working class movement, um, in the social democratic movement, to a head. Uh, and that's when uh, a number of parties, in the first instance, of course, uh, Lenin's party broke with the Second International. And uh, there was a, a, a split between the reformists, the, the, the opportunist parties, and the revolutionary parties that were following a, a Marxist uh, a course. And, uh, and, and out of that split, of course, uh, came the, um, the Third International, which was the Communist International. And so there actually still is a social democratic international. It's called the Socialist International, and it's made up of the NDP and you know all of the the reformist parties. So that's why at the time the Russian Social Democratic Party uh, Labour Party was called what it was called, but of course later on it changed its name. The interesting thing, however, is that if you uh, have, have and you have done the reading you know that, that Lenin was making the case for a communist party, for a revolutionary party. And yet, technically, the first Congress of the Russian Social Democratic Labor Party took place uh, in, in 1898. That was when the first Congress took place. So why were they still debating about a party when the party had already been formed? Well. The, the fact is that uh, the, the first Congress did take place in, I think, 1898. I could be wrong about 1897, 1898. Um, it was a very small Congress. There was about nine delegates there uh, from, from some of the different um, um, circles of, uh, of, of revolutionary workers that, that were in Petrograd, and some of them were in Moscow, and some of them were in uh, in, in different parts of, uh, of, of czarist Russia at the time. Um, some of them were connected to the Bund, which was a, a Jewish uh, working class organization. Um, they had a Congress, they adopted a program, they had an election, they elected a central committee, but within a month of that Congress, seven of the nine delegates were arrested by the czarist police and uh, were sent into internal exile to Siberia or elsewhere and, and, and what have you. And so the party never really got off the ground. Um, they had a Congress, but <laughs> then everything fell apart because of, because of this repression, this police repression. So it wasn't really until the second Congress of the party, which took place in 1903, in other words, uh, about a year after um, uh, Lenin's pamphlet, What is to be Done, came out, that the party really was formed and uh, uh, started a newspaper. I mean, there were workers' papers um, before then, but uh, um, Iskra, which means spark in English, uh, um, became the, the official paper of the party and it started to develop its structure and so on. Uh, and so in many respects, the, the, the birth of the Russian Communist Party, if you will, really doesn't go back to 1898, but it's really in 1903. And so uh, Lenin 
So what happened between 1898 and 1903? Well, obviously there were arrests and there were imprisonments of some of the key activists. But more than that, some of the participants at that first Congress started having second thoughts. Do we really need a party? Maybe, you know, the, the working class movement uh, will have, uh, uh, has a dynamic of its own and uh, there's strikes going on, there's various struggles going on. Maybe it's premature to set up a party and so on. So Lenin wrote uh, what is to be done in order to make the case for a, a, a real proletarian uh, party based on Marxism, uh, based on proletarian internationalism and so on. That's why he wrote the pamphlet. But in order to um, win the argument politically, he had to struggle against those people who were taking uh, what he, um, he referred to as positions uh, of uh, economism. Um, economism being uh, um, essentially an argument um, that uh, the working class was forming trade unions, they were having strikes, there was a mass movement amongst the workers, and that as revolutionaries, all that they really needed to do was, was um, support the workers, try to lend a political character to their economic struggles, uh, but not really to develop um, um, you know, an advanced, disciplined, a revolutionary party. Um, and they were in favor of basically um, um, like a passive role, relying on the spontaneous struggle of the workers uh, to bring about socialism, to bring about revolution. And Lenin um, made the case that uh, in order to convince people that they needed a party, he first had to counter this worshiping of spontaneity and this idea that there's some sort of separation between the economic struggles of workers and their unions and then the political struggle of uh, of uh, labor parties or social democratic parties in their respective parliaments and so on um, and to make that argument lenin in fact relies on what marx and engels themselves said about this question and it's, it's really kind of interesting. I, I, it's not um, pulled out in the study guide, but if you read the whole pamphlet, there's one, uh, one part of the, uh, I think it's the first chapter, the second chapter, where he actually quotes Engels, Frederick Engels, who said, it's not just a question of combining economic and political struggle. Um, Engels said that there's three aspects to, to the revolutionary struggle. Uh, anybody have an idea what the third aspect is? Any thoughts? So you have the economic struggle of the workers, the political struggle uh, against the state, and you know, it could be electoral. It could be you know getting elected to the Duma or to a parliament or something like that. Or it could be fighting against police repression, which is a political struggle. Um, but Engels said that there's actually three parts to the struggle. Anybody have an idea what the third one is? Armed struggle? No, no, no. Engels said that the third component is the theoretical struggle. In other words, the struggle over ideas. So uh, that was another aspect uh, that Lenin was making the case that in order to um, to really struggle against the czarist uh, autocracy and to fight in, in, uh, for the achievement of of a proletarian state and for for socialism, it was necessary to fight on all three levels: the economic struggle of the workers, the political struggle to merge those, and also to merge theory with practice, theory with practice. This is a very important point because uh, the opportunists um, who at, at the time 
uh, Edward Bernstein was probably the most prominent one. He was the head of the German Social Democratic Party. Um, um, was uh, a, there was there was a, a they all said that they were Marxists, okay. But theory was over here, and what was really important was the practical struggle of the workers. And Lenin said, "No, uh, revolutionaries must uh, fuse." theory and practice, and fuse the ideas of Marxism with the working class movement, um, uh, and not uh, allow them to operate separately or on the basis of just spontaneous struggle. Uh, so these were very basic points that, that Lenin uh, tried to get at in this pamphlet. First of all, what was wrong, what was incorrect and dangerous, in fact, in the views of uh, the economists, not the way we talk about economists, but those who advocated economism, this idea that, uh, um, that somehow the, the working class will find its way to socialism and we can just sit back with our lattes in the coffee shops and talk about politics, but uh, you know, the mass movement will, will just learn on its own to struggle uh, for socialism. And, and uh, Lenin said, no, that's not true. What comes out of spontaneous struggle is a trade union consciousness, right? So workers spontaneously are drawn because of the dynamics of the class struggle. The capitalists do what they do. And they do what they do, not because they're pricks, excuse my language, not because they're um, uh, evil doers, they do what they do because that's the dynamics of capitalism. So each individual capitalist will uh, try to increase their profits uh, and they'll try to do it by cutting wages or speed up on the assembly line or uh, very, various means uh, to uh, increase their profits because if they don't do it, they'll be taken over by other capitalists. So that's, that's the, the nature of um, the, the dynamics of capitalism. And in that respect, it's spontaneous. And similarly, it's spontaneous for workers who are on, the, on the, the wrong end of that equation, who are suffering um, uh, intensified exploitation, either on the job, in the workplace, in the factories and the, and, and, and the, the mines and the mills and so on, or in their communities, increased repression from the police and so on, that they will spontaneously struggle against that. Well, the class struggle wasn't invented by Marx or Lenin or so on and so forth. It is, it is, a, it, it is a natural and spontaneous response uh, on a class basis of, of, of workers and, and that response takes the form of, of collective self-defense. So workers didn't need professors to come to them to tell them that they needed unions. They understood that the only chance that they had to fight against their bosses was through collective action. And so they, you know, they, they formed unions and unions were for, being formed even back in the early 1800s. Some of the first craft unions were, were emerging and so on. And those unions would go on strike, they would go into negotiations, they would try to get labor laws passed in parliaments to reduce the um, hour, uh, hours of work, you know, because in those days, you know, workers were working, uh, well, you know, 11, 12 hours a day, six days a week. That was the work week. Um, and they were living basically on starvation uh, wages. They had uh, no protection for um, injuries or, you know, workers' compensation. They didn't have any of that. They didn't have unemployment insurance. They had nothing. Um, and so the unions were established as a self-defense mechanism for the workers. But that's as far as it went. If you're a worker and you fo form a union and you go and you, you fight the boss, you go on strike or you go into negotiations, you're trying to get a better deal from the capitalists. But it's a big leap in terms of consciousness 
to go from there to say, we don't need the capitalists. We can run society ourselves. That's a qualitative leap in terms of consciousness. And it doesn't happen spontaneously. And that was the argument that Lenin was, was uh, making. Um, uh, whereas the opportunists were saying, yeah, it'll just happen by itself naturally. We can just sit back and wait for it to happen. So um, in order to win the argument for a real party of a new type, not a bourgeois party or a reformist party, but a truly revolutionary proletarian party, in order to make that case, he had to fight against all of these harmful ideas. Uh, of spontaneity and of economism and so on. So the whole first part of the pamphlet deals with that. And then uh, by chapter four and five, he starts getting into, okay, now what kind of party uh, do we need? Um, and that debate, of course, continued after the pamphlet came out and right into the first, the, the second Congress in, 2000, in um, 1903. There were still debates about what kind of what kind of revolutionary party should we have? What should be the rules? What should be the principles that that members abide by? Uh, so that debate continued, but what is to be done? Uh, I think anyway was really quite a a pivotal contribution that Lenin made in terms of uh, uh, winning the argument, and he did win the argument. Uh, um, because by 1903, I mean, there was a fervent situation. There were strikes breaking out all over the place, and, and there was police repression, and there were street battles. I mean, it, it was a very dynamic period. And of course, there was not even any semblance of even bourgeois democracy. Workers had no right to vote. They were, you know, uh, they had uh, some sort of... Uh, uh, elected positions, but the Duma had no power, the Tsar decided everything, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and of course, the police had a, a free hand to repress um, the struggles of the people. Uh, so in that fervent period, um, um, Lenin reached the conclusion, which by the way, he didn't pull it out of the, out of the air. Uh, it was based on, and, and, in fact, um, Marx's own teachings much earlier in the 1850s and so on um, about the need for a communist party, uh, a party which would fuse scientific socialism with the working class struggle. And it was out of that that, of course, the whole communist uh, tradition evolved, including our own party, which was uh, founded, you know, not, not so much after this publication, I mean, um, it was 18 years, so that's a fair chunk. But you know, the Communist Party was founded in, in 1921, and this was written in 1903, and the Russian Revolution took place in 1917, and so on. So uh, I probably already said uh, more than I should, but I, I just wanted to give a kind of a context of why this is an important pamphlet and what Lenin uh, it, it tries to do. And let me just finish by saying that um, sometimes when you read Lenin, and I love to read Lenin, and I love to reread Lenin, um, precisely because he's so pugnacious. He's such a fighter. He was such a fighter. And um, um, when he took on a debate, he always did it in a principled way, but he was always very sharp, very crisp in terms of his criticisms of what he considered to be harmful ideas or counter-revolutionary ideas. Um, so it's very lively, in many respects, a lot livelier than reading some of Marx's <laughs> philosophical stuff, which is, you know, I mean, just rich with content, but not necessarily very lively. That's why I've always preferred to read Lenin. Um, But the, but the problem with reading Lenin, of course, is precisely because he's polemicizing with these other people uh, and he's talking about real events, this meeting here, that article there, and so on and so forth. It's easy to get lost about, you know, who's on first base, you know, the old, the old joke about who's on first base. Who are all these people? Um, and uh, 
and it requires a little bit of discipline. Uh, if you if you actually look at these pamphlets, if you go to the back to the index of the pamphlets, they, they will always have footnotes, and there will be a lot of footnotes, and each one of those footnotes explains who so and so was or what this meeting was all about or so on and so forth. But you have to go back and forth, you know, from the from the from the text to the footnote and back to the text and so on. It, it it's demanding. But once you get into it, and once you start getting familiar with some of these characters, um, um, it becomes really engaging. And you really start to get a, a sense of what these revolutionaries were struggling with. Uh, and the fact that it, there wasn't a simple course forward, they were doing it for the first time. They were trying to build a party of a new type for the first time. Um, and. Uh, um, so I would encourage you to try to read this whole pamphlet and to read other of, of, of Lenin's uh, articles and, and works. And what you'll find is as the more you get into it, the more it'll start, the pieces will start coming together, the threads will start connecting, and you'll really get a sense of how our movement evolved. It's kind of like I don't know how many of you are into cosmology or, uh, you know, um, you know, uh, astronomy and so on and so forth. But it's it's like going back to the Big Bang, you know, and trying to understand how the universe uh, evolved and and uh, uh, and so on. That happens to be a kind of a pet interest of mine. But it, but in in many respects, it's kind of similar. Um, so I would encourage you, uh, even if you find it kind of difficult at first to to get into it, uh, to, to try to do that. And you'll find that as you get into it, all of these uh, things which really make communist uh, uh, distinctive, okay? Why it is, for instance, that communists have a long-term program. We're the only political party in this country that has a, has a long-term program. All the other parties just have platforms, you know? They, they follow uh, uh, opinion polls. They, they figure out, you know, well, how can we get elected and, you know, what buttons that we should push and so on and so forth. But they have no long-term perspective. But communists do. And why is it? It's because we have a worldview. We have a, a theoretical framework. Uh, and, uh, and we also have an approach that combines theory with practice. Um, um, Lenin... Uh, in fact, uh, has a famous quote that without revolutionary theory, there's no revolutionary movement. And I think another one of his quotes, I believe it was from Lenin, was that uh, um, theory alone, those people who are just armchair theorists, uh, theory is barren, empty, but practice is blind. Pa practice without theory is blind. So you need both. You need both uh, a theoretical grounding and, uh, and you then have to apply it and test it in practice and everything that we do and evaluate it and then, and then come back and, and further enrich our understanding, not only of the struggle in Canada today, or what's going on internationally today, um, but even more so what's coming in the future. Uh, so it's that combination of theory and practice, which makes communists very unique in terms of the political struggle. Um, and, uh, and I've said enough. So I'm going to stop there. And let's just open it to the floor. Anything that anybody wants to raise about the reading, um, any questions people have, the floor is, is yours. So 